Welcome to Hip to the Scene. Talking music, Talking music videos, videos, and everything in between. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to episode 13 of Hip to the Scene, where every episode we take the opportunity to talk to an expert, someone who's been part of the musical world for quite some time, someone who has the sage wisdom and experience to tackle the most difficult questions, the ones that up-and-coming independent creatives ask the most. And the idea is, if we can bring in someone who has lived it and breathed it and knows from experience what could potentially be your best path forward, this is important, compelling visual content that we know is going to help lots and lots of artists and bands. And today, ladies and gentlemen, the question is simple. Why is picking the right producer so important? And we're very blessed and privileged to have one of the top shelf world-class producers currently out there fighting the good fight, continuing to make great records. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is the one and only Godfrey Diamond. Godfrey, welcome to Hip to the Scene. Hey, Andy, thanks for having me. Well, you know, it's a pleasure. And certainly this question is one that is asked quite often because you and I both know not having the right producer, the right person there to help guide you through a musical project can have serious effects on the final product. And you have created tons and tons of records over your five decade career. And we wanna know Godfrey, for up and coming artists, what are some of the important questions that you should be asking of a prospective producer? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question, Andy. Um, yeah, man. Thanks for having me on your show. I really want to, um, if I can help anybody out there starting out or even further on in their career, um, that's a pretty big question. I've been in, I've been in that position many times. Um, one thing I would kind of want to know is their influences. I think I would want to kind of <clears throat> get an idea of who they like just naturally. I would want to know if they um you know and even if they aren't liking the exact bands that you like that's okay they have to have a feel for your for your music and the vibe that you want to do um you also want to know about their recording philosophy um are they like the kind of guy or or girl that is running the tape from the beginning are they recording everything you do um if you're doing like um you're probably running pro tools these days or another workstation um <clears throat> are they the kind of producer that wants to lay down like okay let's do 15 tracks of this and then when you leave i'll edit it all together um or do they want to on the playlist you know what i mean or do they want to try to capture a great performance while you're there what I like to do is try to get a great performance. And because um, you'll find a lot of those takes when you do 12 or 15 takes of the same thing, they're always screwing up the same part. It's always like into the bridge or out of the chorus. It's always something like that. So the best way to do it is to focus on those spots and maybe do 10 of those little spots, you know, not do the whole song 10, 15 times. It's just, you know, because they can get bored, they'll lose their vibe. Uh, anyway, I've had more success really pushing it that way. 
I'd also want to say that I would like to know that they have good instincts. I think a producer, it's important for them to have good instincts um, about your music and about music in general. Um, and are they coming to your rehearsal? Uh, you know, are they going to be there? Um, that's very important to go over the songs. Are they, you know, how much time are they going to spend with you in the studio and out of the studio so that there's a there's a common bond? Well, everyone watching should know that Godfrey has had the great pleasure to work with some of the biggest and most important members of the music community. Lou Reed, Gloria Gaynor, Frank Sinatra, Aerosmith, Billy Squire. These are just a few of the renowned names that Godfrey Diamond has produced and or sound engineered going all the way back to the early 70s. And to be able to get consultation and advice from someone who has done so much in his creative journey is really quite the blessing. And it's inspiring that someone like Godfrey would take time out to talk to us all here on this transmission. Now, it's important to note, not only does he have lots of experience and sage wisdom, but here's a guest that was literally born, born to do what he's doing, make music. It's been said, if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. And at the age of 21, Godfrey, our guest, he produced Lou Reed's Coney Island Baby. He was also there, not just playing the drums, but behind the scenes and recording and producing the Andrea True Connection. We all remember more, 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 at least those of us who were around then. But that is a song that will live in perpetuity. It went to number one on the Billboard charts. And I'm sure, Godfrey, these are some of your proudest moments. But we're talking darn near 50 years ago. And since that time, <laughs> you have yeah. just done so much for so many. I just got to know you are a great communicator and you're a human magnet. People love to work with you. I mean, isn't that a big part of being a successful producer? Oh yeah, I think that communication is 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 really important. Um, in fact, I have a sign in my studio, and it says um, T C P P P T C P, so you can remember. Um, and it stands for tone, confidence, pitch phrasing, projection. Um, what I, the reason I, I use that is there's sometimes new artists aren't that familiar with the, um, the, the, the language part of the studio. And like, um, it helps, it helps to have a language between you. Like if, if somebody's doing a vocal out there and they keep, messing up the same spot over and over and over again it's good to talk about it because they might just say i don't know it doesn't feel good it, do it doesn't you know i i want to do it again but if it happens a lot yeah you could just try it again sure but if it happens a lot you might want to like find out why is it the pitch is it the tone is it the um phrasing the projection which part of it is making it so you don't like it um it also is a tool that I can use to ask them about it. And usually it's the tone that I, I'm most concerned with because I'm I want to get a great sounding tone on the on the record, on the mic there. So um, you know, the communication is is part of it. It's also finding the strength and the weakness of your artists. All artists have strengths and weaknesses, like all of us. And um it's very important to be able to focus on the things that need a little more work 
and um, be able to handle it. Do you need to help collaborate the, on the bridge, write it a little better, or work on this part more? Do you need to put another hook in there, another guitar to make people, you know, feel it more? Or, you know, there's so many parts of the record that you have to look at and, and make sure they're all, you know, as good at, at as high a level as the rest of the song or as about the rest of the record. Um, so that's my feeling about communication. Very important. <laughs> well, your approach to music production is very much on the communicative, communicative level. And we all know that it's important, especially with a successful record and creating a great presentation that pre-production, I know that is an important part of your approach to music production. Yeah. Well, I look at um, the, my approach of, of, to making a record to producing, it's kind of like there's four categories. You got your pre-pro, which is pre-production, obviously, recording, overdubs, and mixing. And when you look at them that way, there's four different sections of it. It's just not that daunting making a record because you hear a record and you see a video. It's like, oh, my God, how could they do that? You know, because it just looks it's so amazing sometimes. But if you, you know, boil it down to the areas that you're working on and you take them one at a time, it's a lot easier. Um, so I find that um, a lot of pre-production is going to save you time for the whole, for every part of the record. I do a lot, lot of pre-production. I work for a long time, rehearse, whether it's rehearsing the songs over and over to get them really good, to make them real second nature, or if it's, um, you know, working out the, the melodies, make sure all the melodies are great, check the lyrics, make sure people, the, the person is saying what they want to say in the best way. Um, not that I would ever veto a lyric or a melody, but I would bring it up to their attention to see, could this be a little better? Because remember, that thing doesn't disappear. It's always there. You still can go back to it. But you could try a new idea if a producer has an idea. And you must trust. You, you, if you're picking a producer, you better trust him because he's kind of guiding you and guiding the record and helping you stay on course. So. Trust is also a big part of it. Well, it certainly is. And I think the viewing audience needs to know that over all of these years of helping artists and bands, there have been great, incredible, memorable moments. But you were there, Godfrey. Can you talk about some of the most uh, memorable, the moments you're most proud of over your illustrious career? Oh, well, I, the Lou Reed records, are, I'm very proud of that. It was my first real producing. Um, and the same year, I, I did the more and more and more thing with my brother. And, you know, that was kind of neat to have the top, the number one record in the world, plus having the um, biggest underground record at the same time. Coney Island Baby was a big club, club closer in New York, and I'm sure in a bunch of other cities. The lights would start to flicker and people would go home and the Coney Island Baby would come on the speakers and it was a vibe. Um, yeah, and that that record did really well. I was very happy with it. Frank Sinatra was a, was a big moment too. Um, um, I love the Aerosmith record that I made. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm also I'm also proud of the new things I'm working on too, <laughs> um, which I hope you're going to talk about soon. Big dream. Absolutely. Well, I will tell everybody watching that throughout the '80s and '90s, Godfrey continued to work with top shelf, world class talent, and people came to Godfrey for many reasons, but one of them, Godfrey, is because you're a drummer and you have, over the course of your career, 
proven that if you're looking for someone out there to get just the right drum sound, and you want a producer who knows how to get those drum sounds, because that is the foundation, nobody can do it like Godfrey. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I love drums. Uh, I feel everything starts with the drums, actually. Um, I look at them as the skeleton of like the body and everything else is just, you know, the clothes, they're all the, the skin, the bones, everything is laying on the skeleton, which is the drums. Um, very important to have the drums appropriate to the song sonically, but also the feel. Are they going to be driving? Are they going to be heavy? Are they going to be laying back? It's so important, the drum sound. Um, so, you know, I love I love trying a lot of mics and, and, and getting different parts of the room to respond for room sounds and um, turning mics around and putting them lower, putting them higher. Um, nice ribbon mics on the room is very effective. Um, I particularly love the Coles. It's one, of, it's one of the mics that I love, like about 10 feet away from the drummer about three feet up, not high. Also, I might put some high ones back there, but I end up depending on the calls a lot. Um, anyway, I don't want to get too technical about this stuff, but yeah, drums are drums are a gas, man. You got to get it right. Get it right from the beginning. If you do that, your whole the whole road is going to be really easy. Everything just lays right on top of that. It's really, really smooth if you get the drums and bass right up front. You're on your quest to pick the right producer, Godfrey, and the producer you've narrowed it down to, he's going to insist that the project play to a click track. What say you? That's something you want to find out in pre-production. You don't, one of the biggest mistakes I find people making with that is they they wait till they go to the studio to find out the tempo with a song. It's crazy. It's crazy. That should all be done in rehearsal. You should, the way I find the, first of all, the click, the BPM is really important. So um, I'll let the band rehearse loose with no click, completely just like feeling good. And I'd record, just put it down on, on something, just record on something. And then when I play it back, I'll find the click setting, the um, the BPM, and it's usually it's moving a little bit because humans do move a little bit. And you find a place in the middle somewhere, maybe the chorus speeds up, maybe the verse slows down. There's obvious things that happen. So you get your you get your uh, click number, and then you you continue to do some trials in rehearsal, trying different clicks till it feels really good so that you can take that element of surprise out of it. So you're not in the studio that day and the drummer goes, yeah, man, I hear it up here at, at 98. Then the drummer goes, the, I'm sorry, the guitar player goes, no, 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 man, that's too fast. Down in 95 is better, 95. You're talking about three BPM. You know, um, it could go, and it could go either way, but you want to iron all that stuff out before you get to the studio. Very important. You don't want to waste time thinking about what tempo the, the damn song is. Because, you know, different days, songs sound better, different tempos sometimes. So get that over with in pre-production. Perfect Mixes Studio in Brooklyn, New York. Godfrey had worked at the biggest, most famous certainly the most expensive recording studios on the planet. New York City, the center of the universe. And because you'd worked with so many important top flight talented people, tell us about how 20 years ago, I'm going to build my own studio. It's going to be right here in Brooklyn. Everything's going to be here. Life will be good. 
let there be rejoicing. Talk about that, Godfrey, the beginnings of Perfect Mixes Studio. Sure. Well, after working in a ton of studios, um, I kind of, uh, I've also built three of my own. Um, and I've worked, you know, I worked in tons of different ones. I, and I had one in Williamsburg that, that I had for a while in the, like 2000, uh, from 2000 to 2005. Uh, and I learned a lot of things working there that I wanted to fix. So when I finally got a house, um, I could put, put a studio on the ground floor. It's entirely floated. Um, for people that don't know what that means, it, it means that if the guys are drilling outside, you're not going to hear it because there's it's kind of suspended and floated in air. It's basically there's things that hold it. There's springs in the ceiling. There's, you know, there's a lot of floating is a, is a whole other world, but it, it's like a box in a box. So, you know, double windows, all that stuff. So you can do whatever you want in there and and your neighbors aren't going to, you know, hear you and you're not going to be influenced by sirens going by and stuff like that in the street, um, like workmen and con ed guys and all that. So it's, um, now the studio is built well, but the great thing about having my own studio is that I can, I'm very used to the sound in, in that room. And if you talk to most really good mixers, they're going to usually want to be in the same room all the time for their mixes. I just found that over the years because you know, you know where the base is. It's so important to know where the base is. That's always the question. You get to the end of the mix and you, the guy looks at you or you look at the guy. Is, it, is there enough base or is there too much base? Or, you know, that's the, because it's the base will sound different in anywhere you take it. When you take it home and you take it in the car, when you bring it anywhere, the base is always changing. So it's good to be in a room that you're really familiar with because you know exactly where the base should be. There's no doubt about it. And you speak to anybody that's been in their room long enough, you know, you, you got it. You got it down and you don't have to guess where the base should be. You know where the base should be. I think that basic tracks vitally important. If you're looking to find the right producer, you need to know that not only are they going to knock it out of Yankee Stadium on the technical end. Godfrey, talk about how you're part cheerleader, part taskmaster, part psychologist, probably times you wish you were a psychiatrist. Everything's riding on this recording, and you literally have to wear many hats. Talk about how a producer needs to be more than just the technical guy. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, being a person that does wear both hats, I'm the engineer often, and I am the producer often, but I love having my own engineer. Um, if the uh, client can afford it, <laughs> or I might just bring them in anyway, because I, I, I like having an engineer, but um, I always mix it myself in the end. And um, I am a hands-on producer. Um, but it is very important to understand your artists because there's always going to hit some time throughout an album. An album could take between two weeks and three months, you know, and there's going to be good days. and There's going to be bad days. Um, he might come, the, the singer might come in. He just had a fight with his girlfriend. He feels like shit. Um, uh, you might have a woman that comes in and she doesn't feel well that day. You have to be generous with your emotions and you have to um, be open to hearing what they have to say and try to get them to move the blood around a little bit so they can think about it differently so they can get the job done eventually. Um, it's very important for a producer to create an environment where an artist wants to give you their best work. So sometimes, yeah, you do have to be a shrink to some extent. And sometimes you do have to listen to them. And sometimes you do have to go get a cup of coffee and stop the session and just, you know, take a minute, let people breathe for a minute. 
you know, there's a time to pull back and let them breathe. There's a time to like hit them heavy, go, 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 give me another one, give me another one, give me another one. And you also have to say you're doing basic tracks. You got to watch the energy of the drummer very closely. Being a drummer myself, I always know which song I want to do first that day and which song I want to do last because it it's um, it's important to have that energy right up front when the guy's like, or the girl, whoever's drumming, is pumping and they're really full of strength and they want to get it. Um, and they have the attention and the focus to really nail it. Um, and then, you know, after the lunch break, a little later, everybody's a little relaxed and it, you might want to pull out the ballad, you know, and make it nice and easy and slow and everybody's in a good head together and you, you pull off a ballad. There's little things like that, that, that calling the right song at the right time that makes your job a lot easier. So um, I think that I think that that's important, too. Let's talk about budgetary constraints. It seems, Godfrey, that this topic is top of mind with so many of the best of the best out there. They want to spend the least amount of money, but they want great results. It's a difficult situation. Probably people would just, it would be their greatest joy to work with Godfrey at Perfect Mixes Studio, but they don't have the resources to do that. And of course, you want to work with the best of the best, but what's your advice to artists and bands out there that either A, don't have the resources to work with the producer they'd like to, or or actually considering self-producing. Is that an option, Godfrey? Sure, it is an option. Um, I'd say if somebody has some something and they can't afford a producer, I say, let me hear it. Before you say you can't afford it, let me hear it. And let me decide if you can't afford it. Because if I feel it's really, really special, I might just take a shot on it um, if it's that amazing. Um, there's also no rule that you have to have a producer. Um, if you can't afford a producer, I mean, there's some people that work better without a producer. Um, look at Tame Impala. I mean, he's had so much success with those records and he produces them himself. Um, however, I think that's a, a small percentage of the, the artists out there that can actually pull it off themselves because you at least have to have somebody kind of watching it. If you can use an engineer as a producer, kind of like to have somebody like watching you, if you trust them and you think that they have a good vibe on your sound and know, know how to, how to make it happen. Um, you can kind of do that. I went, I was used a lot when I used to, back in the day when I was an engineer, I know that we call them the phone producers. They, once they find out that, that I was a, actually a producer in my own right, they kind of take off and spend a lot of time in the producer's lounge. Like, sure, I won't mention any names, but they would be in the producer's lounge setting up their next record on the phone and I'd be in there producing it. Now, come on, it didn't happen that much, but it did happen a fair amount. Um, and that actually made me want to be a producer because I got, I got all that experience producing, you know, it was great. Um, so it has, it's, um, you know, it's good, good parts and it's bad parts, but about not having a producer, um, you should, someone should be kind of looking out for you. I think that it's hard to be in there and have to wear all those hats like be the singer be the producer maybe be the engineer maybe, you know it's a lot of hats to wear um and you know it also can become kind of mono sounding and i don't mean as opposed to stereo sounding i mean like like one mind is sometimes one mind can do it 
Let's face it, Paul McCartney did it on McCartney. He did it. He produced it himself. He played the drums. He played everything. Stevie Wonder did it. He played all the instruments, produced it himself. I know because I was there. Um, he um, And like I said, Tame and Palette can do There are some people that are able to do that. But I find it very rare. And I think it's such a it's a great thing to have somebody that's, you know, has your best interest at heart. That's there to make sure you're you're making the record the best way and can also get you across all the pitfalls. They can save you so much money and time because they've done it so many times. They make it easy, man. You know, they know how much rehearsal you need. Are the songs right? They'll go over all your parts with you, hopefully. They'll make sure everything's right before you get in there. And you're like, okay, now what do I do? I did this. I, I got the drums and bass. Now what do I do? You know, there's, you know, there's times there's a good sequence of making records and a good producer, you know, has his ways of making things flow quickly and, you know, where to spend the time and really get it right. And when to like, <laughs> we can get that part done. Let's move on. We got it. Well, Godfrey, you really do know what you're doing. And we've spoken about pre-production, how important pre-production can be having your focus on pre-production can, as Godfrey mentioned, save you a ton of cash when you're actually in the studio making things happen. But let's say you're a band from New Jersey and you're able to have the pleasure of working with Godfrey Diamond at Perfect Mixes Studios in Brooklyn, and he knocks it out of the park and you get this incredible record. Godfrey, can you speak to how important post-production, mastering, I don't think a lot of up-and-coming independent artists are appreciative of how important all of that is. There's a saying about mastering, um, and it kind of capsulizes the whole viewpoint. <clears throat> a mastering engineer cannot make it a hit, but he can sure as hell stop one. And that is what, what happens in mastering. They can, they can really screw you up. You know, oh, look at this. Try this. It's heavy bass. It's heavy this. Boom, boom, boom. Like, and then you go home and it sounds like shit. It sounds amazing in their space. It sounds like shit at home. I will not use a mastering engineer unless he's been doing it at least seven years. I feel you have to be doing mastering longer than engineering to be a good mastering engineer because you have to have heard so many records. So much stuff has been coming through your ears and through your system because you're, let's face it, a good mastering engineer, they do three things. They get the volume right on the record. They adjust the tone and they sequence your album, you know, the order of the songs front to back. The tone is a big thing. They get your bass and your, your treble, they get everything together. You want somebody that's been doing that a long time to be doing that for you. Look, when I make a record, sure, I could master it myself. Of course I could. I could go in, I could tweak a little and, and master it myself. I never do. I always have a mastering engineer and um, he it's that next chance to, to just make it a little, let someone else's ears pass by it, you know, let it pass by some other ears to just make sure it's, it's got it all. It's got everything there because they're going to hear frequencies that you might've missed or that your system, even though I listen to it on my, I have three systems down in the studio to listen to it on. I lab, I can listen in the car. I actually have it piped up here to the living room so I can even sit here and have it on my speakers. See, I can't really see my speakers, but you got my speakers over there. And um, so I, I just like hit a button and boom, I have it upstairs and I'm, uh, I just come up here, you know, have a beer, listen, listen to it in a living room. Because it's very important to listen to your stuff in different places before you say it's done. 
not just on headphones, but headphones are important too. All of them are important because it's going to be, you have no control over it. When it goes out, it leaves your hands. You know, you can't, you can't attach an, an equalizer to it. It just goes out. It better sound great on everything. That's what I said. So, yes, I think mastering is a very important step. And Godfrey, on top of all of your accolades, you now have a creative project where you bring all these great people, people who have always been attracted to you, like the human magnet you are, top shelf, world class, just talent, talent that's over, over the top. And it's your new musical project, Big Dream. Big Dream is my own little studio project that I love. I love to work on. Um, it's my experimental um, place, sonic experimental place, where I can try out different people and try out different instruments and try out all these things and and um sometimes it ends up where i create a bunch of songs and um so big dream is a project that's a revolving studio project there's different singers that that will sing on it there's different players that will play on it and everybody's high is our first single as you can see behind me um and it's a the first video single and it's uh, it's got some amazing people on it. It's got Maricel Lineman, and she's classically trained pianist, and she's a co-writer on the song as well as singing it. She's fantastic. She's a lot of fun to work with. Um, I also got my buddy and great guitar player, Robbie. Robbie Mangano is also known as Sea Hag in the New York musician world, and he plays with a ton of people, including Sean Lennon and many other greats. Um, another guitar player that's working on this record with me is uh, Billy Ryan, and he was in the he is currently in the Bogman, and they're actually playing a lot around town again. They're really starting to get things popping, and um, he totally made the, the guitars so great. I love them, and um, I don't want to just go down a list, but there's a lot of great players on here, including Mars Williams. He's playing sax at the end of the record from the psychedelic furs. And um, eh, he's just a trip, man. And, you know, let the record play through. Don't stop it at a minute and a half or two minutes, like they say on YouTube. People only listen for a minute and a half to most records. It's like, let it go, because at the end of the record, it really builds and gets going. And these guitars, like, and, and sax has a lot of fun together. Um, also, the drums are by Joe Russo, who has a band called J-Rad, and they play a lot all over the place. They're a fantastic band. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're working on a new one for Big Dream right now, and there's a lot of really cool people I'm going to have playing on that. I'm going to be digging into my um, old stable of players that are so brilliant. Um, like the guy from the guy that's playing drums on it. He's fooling around with the song right now. And he plays with Bob Dylan, 20 years with Bob Dylan. And he's an amazing drummer. His name is George Rosselli. And um, so it'll be a welcome. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be great to have George play on it. And um, a lot of other people are playing on it. That the, the names are going to keep coming up. I'm probably going to call Elliot Randall. He's over in uh, England right now. He played on so many records back in the back in the day growing up. Uh, he actually is well known for his solo in Reeling in the Years. You know that song? That's Elliot. Um, so he'll be a nice uh, little part of it if he plays some stuff on there. So I'm going to ask a few people and see see who who wants to try it and play it and. Um, I'm excited to to work on this next song. It's, it's going to be very different. Um, so uh, I hope you all enjoy it. We'll definitely be making a video. And um, yeah, so that's Big Dream. Well, I am sure I'm a, 
uh, speaking for everyone here, they're all going to go check out Big Dream. This is Godfrey Diamond's new musical project. And you might think, well, he's so busy helping others with their recordings. How does he find the time or the creative energy to create this new project? But I would contend that if you have access to some of the most talented musicians, artists, singers. Godfrey, they're just a phone call away. Everybody's lining up to be a part they're there. of Big Dream. They're there. We do very much appreciate you all watching this episode of Hip to the Scene. Why is picking the right producer so important? And we've just been able to hear lots of great knowledge and wisdom and advice from someone who you can absolutely trust to give you the straight scoop on how, as an independent artist, you can get to the next level and how inspiring that he is actually currently an independent artist with his own musical group. And though Godfrey's got many, many very tall oak trees to his credit, I would say with big dreams, God, big dream, Godfrey from small acorns, big oak trees grow. You just keep doing what you're doing. Oh, I love it. I'll never stop. It's a pleasure. It's fun. And I had a lot of fun talking to you, Andy. This was a this was a good time. Well, I feel exactly the same way, Godfrey. And anybody who wants to find out more about Big Dream, all you have to do is look at the bottom of your screen right now. We're going to have the ways to find Big Dream. And Godfrey, how do people find Perfect Mixes Studio? Really simple, perfectmixes.com. Just go there. You'll see all this uh, information about my studio. But also feel free to go to Instagram and see Godfrey Diamond and Big Dream. If you put Godfrey Diamond and Big Dream, you will end up there. And you just hit the bio link. You can see the video. You see the interviews I've done. And there's a lot of fun pictures to look at there and all that stuff. So enjoy. Well, you heard earlier in this transmission, Godfrey, when someone reaches out about potentially hiring him to produce for them, he encourages people to send music along. So just imagine what a huge win it could be for your musical career to have the opportunity to work with someone like Godfrey who could really make that pivotal, profound difference in your creative journey. And it's better to try something and fail than do nothing and succeed. And yes, I hope everyone watching this episode, you go and check out Perfect Mixes Studio. You go and check out Big Dream, Godfrey's latest musical project. And you can go to many different articles to find out more about this incredible creative, someone who's been fighting the good fight for over five decades, done so many exciting things in his life. And it's very clear, everybody, Godfrey ain't slowing down anytime soon. Godfrey, thank you for being a guest on Hip to thank the you. Scene. Yeah, man. Thank you very much, Andy. It was a pleasure. Well, you're very welcome. And if you enjoy these episodes, please tell your friends. Please subscribe to our channel to make sure that you never miss an episode. And once again, thank you, Godfrey. It was a pleasure. We appreciate you being a guest on Hip to the Scene. Awesome. Thank you.